everybody. Welcome to this week's podcast. There's no special announcements or anything, so let's just jump right into it. First up, a few weeks ago, the Video Game History Foundation posted a video that showed an emulated version of the Sega VR headset. And anybody that remembers those magazine articles from the 90s probably remembers the pictures and all the hype from Sega and all the things they were talking about that really are still not even perfected today that they were trying to do back then. And then eventually they just kind of canceled the project. And later on, you found out that it was giving people headaches. And I imagine the 15 frame per second VR on a 16-bit console probably wasn't going to get the best experience. But the Video Game History Foundation was able to get a prototype ROM and was able to hack it to work with a special version of emulation software so you could use it on modern VR equipment. And it was really neat to finally see this thing in action. Um, there's links to download the ROM, to download the emulator, and I believe you could even tweak it to do uh, red and green or red and blue side by side um, 3D glasses like that if you wanted to try it that way. But overall, it was just very cool to see it in action. And of course, this is definitely not something that would hold up today. Uh, you know, it doesn't have the charm of some of those 16-bit games. But at the same time, it was really awesome to see what this could have been. And uh, I think Sega made the right decision not releasing it. But now that uh, now that this video is out there, as well as the ROM, you could make that decision for yourself. So I don't think it's a fully playable game, but the game Nuclear Rush is at least available to see what it's like. And if you have a VR platform and the ability to emulate stuff, and of course, you know, the desire to look at a 16-bit VR thing, I would definitely do it because it just looks like a pretty cool window into what could have been. Um, I still don't own a, any kind of VR stuff. I think I'm waiting for the, the next generation, or I guess the current generation of stuff to start trickling out. Um, I'll eventually get one, but it, the last few times I tried it, it ended up giving me a headache. So I'll just wait until it's a little more advanced, which is actually hilarious because the Virtual Boy does not give me a headache, but modern VR does. Go figure. <laughs> Professor Abrasive has just released a custom firmware for the action replay um, to use when in conjunction with the Satiator. And I thought his post was a little bit unclear, no offense or anything, but um, so I just kind of wanted to write it up myself and give my own impressions of how to do it and why you would want to do it. And the basic overview is if you have a Satiator plugged into your Saturn and you have an action replay plugged in, um, it'll try to boot to the action replay first and you can't really get to the games loaded on your SD card. So what this custom firmware does is replace the action replay firmware 2.02c with one that when it detects the satiator, it boots right to it. Um, so this is actually pretty handy because if you own one of these but also use discs or if you swap satiators between friends or something uh, without the satiator plugged in, it just works like an action replay. And with it plugged in, it just skips it and allows you to go right to the main menu to select your game, but still acts as a 4 meg RAM cart. Now, as far as I know in its current configuration, you can't use cheats with games launched from the SD. However, if you still want to use disks from different regions or cheats on disks, if you hold A while powering on the Saturn, it'll boot to the action replay menu, and then you could in turn put in your disk and play it that way. Um, so essentially skipping the satiator altogether. But I don't think there's any way to actually launch it with that. And I know uh, a bunch of other custom firmwares for pseudo Saturn Kai have been released for things like the Fenrir that allow for um, full functionality with the ODE. So I'm not sure we're seeing any of that yet with this action replay firmware, but it's still a convenience that makes sense. I loaded it on mine so I could still have full functionality on everything. And, um, uh, you know, I just hope that someday it gets pushed a little bit further or maybe pseudo Saturn Kai could have a version that works with this, just like the custom version they made for the Fenrir as well. Um, installing it's a bit nerve wracking because if you want to use the satiator to install the custom firmware on it, you need to power on the console first, uh, update the firmware to the latest version and the menu of, you know, the satiator firmware first, then get into the menu. And then after you're in the menu, very carefully insert the action replay cart, uh, which of course makes most retro nerds nervous because you're never, ever supposed to put a cartridge in or out of a console with it powered on. Um, but I tried it anyway, and everything seemed to go pretty easily on this. Um, and then once you plug it in, you actually have three options. Back up the original firmware, which, you know, it's, it's always good to do. 
erase the action replay, which is handy if you just want a RAM cart. You don't care about anything else. You just want a cheap new RAM cart that you might have picked up on Amazon. Uh, so that's a decent feature. And if you erase it, you could always flash whatever firmware you want on it. And then another option is to flash the action replay firmware, which uh, you would then just select whatever file you have right on the SD card, um, and you're able to flash it right from there. So anybody watching on video, you could see that um, I have both the backup that I did and the patched version of the firmware sitting on the SD, and I was able to do it that way. So overall, um, it's a pretty cool idea. I'm really happy that uh, all of the Saturn ODEs are starting to get some kind of different functionality with pseudo Saturn Kai and uh, action replay and all that other stuff. And I'll keep everybody posted as to the new ones. I didn't do a guide on the Fenrir one because I don't own one of those, but um, hopefully I'll end up picking one of those up when the next rev is eventually released. I know Seth had teased that he had 21 pin support working. Um, he had teased that on Twitter. And, but there was no further info on it other than it was working in a dev environment, which is why we never posted about it. Because, you know, at that point, there's no real news. I think he came close to having it working when I did the review of it. So, um, you know, not trying to take away from his progress or anything. I'm just excusing why I didn't feel the need to write a post on it. It's still awesome progress and everything. But uh, maybe I'll pick up one of those and be able to do uh, more guides on that when it comes out. But overall, it's looking really good if you're a Saturn owner and you want all of these different features and optical drive emulators. Castlemania Games is now selling Tian Fang's Omega MVS replacement RGB board, which is good to hear because apparently there was a lot more demand for those than were originally anticipated. Um, so it's cool that a bigger store is having them and stocking them for people that need it. Uh, and just some quick history on what this was. Um, the Omega MVS is a consoleized MVS with an absolutely beautiful plastic case that looks really close to what you would find in an original Neo Geo AES. And it was made back in 2001. And back in 2001, I would have called the video output and its options absolutely amazing. But, you know, it's almost 10 years later now. And while the video circuit is still absolutely good and respectable, and I think Quan did a great job with all of the different performance upgrades that we figured out over the past 10 years, um, Tian Feng was able to create a board that just drops right in. It just uh, unplugs. There's no soldering. There's nothing to worry about. All you need is a Phillips head screwdriver and enough sense to unplug the power from the machine when you're swapping it out. Um, but you drop this board in and you lose composite video, you lose component video, but you gain really clear RGB video. Uh, as well as a slight upgrade in audio. Um, you could tweak the audio different ways. I, you know, I don't want to get too deep into that because audiophiles will, not only will they probably already know about this, but they probably have their own preferences. But just your average user would call this uh, definitely an upgrade in video and probably an upgrade in audio. And it's been my recommendation that, you know, if you have a CRT setup um, that you already like, that you're happy with, just leave well enough alone. Um, but if you're going through, you know, a, the OSSC in 5X mode and you've taken the time to set phase, um, something like this would actually be a noticeable upgrade. Uh, when I first did the video on it, it was just kind of an interesting look at, at this kind of expensive but still really cool console. And uh, I didn't really expect people to uh, to be as excited about this upgrade board. And I, to be honest, I just expected a wall of trolls of people saying, this is useless, why would anybody waste their money on it? And it was the opposite. There was a whole bunch of people saying, this is awesome. And then a few months later after the boards went out, I started to get a wave of new comments on that video of people saying, I just bought the board, this was definitely cool. You know, it's not a massive upgrade, but I could definitely notice the difference. So it was pretty neat. Um, you know, sorry to retell the story for anybody who's been a, a listener since then or before, but I was just, uh, I thought this was kind of a neat thing and I'm glad Castlemania picked it up. So thanks to Ryan for always taking the time to pay attention to the products and, and projects that might not be as big a deal as some of the other ones that he works on. And of course, thanks to Tian Fang for making this and putting up with uh, all of the crazy crap that I sent him to work on. <laughs> The musician Remute has just announced his upcoming album, Electronic Lifestyle, which is going to be released on TurboGrafx-16 and PC Engine Hue cards. And like some of his previous work, 
This music was designed to be listened on original consoles with the consoles themselves generating the audio, which is really unique and different. Um, and I think it went over really well both previous times. Um, I purchased both of them. Uh, Techno Optimistic on the Genesis, I think was my favorite, which, you know, it's music. It's all preference. I'm not, I'm not trying to be a music critic. I'm just saying uh, I loved that one. I used that music in a ton of my videos. Uh, but also the Super Nintendo album, The Cult of Remute, was also excellent and uh, I used that one as well in at least one video as background and I asked permission of course I didn't just steal his music and throw it in my videos <laughs> but um, I'm really interested to see what he could do with the PC Engine and Turbo Graphics because I think some games on that platform didn't really use the audio to its fullest extent much like the Sega Genesis so I'm really curious to hear how it's going to sound um, and I would definitely like to experience it on refurbished real hardware you know nothing crazy just stuff with the capacitors replaced so you don't have audio changing because the components are, are starting to get old and leak um, the only thing to note about purchasing uh, a few things on the Bandcamp page it says pre-order record vinyl but what it's actually talking about is the Hue card. It's just that Bandcamp doesn't have a drop-down option for T TurboGrafx-16 cards, which makes sense. Um, also, the TurboGrafx-16 version is only going to be available till January 22nd, um, and the default version is for the PC Engine. Uh, so, when you purchase this, you just have to leave a note, you know, please send the Turbo Graphics version, please send the PC Engine version, etc. And then after the end of January, it'll only be the PC Engine version that's available. And these are looking to ship around the first week of March, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, it's a shipping out on or around March 3rd, 2021. So um, I'm definitely picking up one of these. Uh, I'm really interested to see how it's going to sound. And I'm, I'm definitely a fan of his work. So uh, hopefully if he allows, I'll be able to use this music as well in the background of some of my videos because I just thought it added such a really cool vibe to some of them. And I really enjoyed it. So if you're into this stuff, even in the slightest, check out Danielle's post and see if this one's for you. Here's kind of a fun one. Somebody took the time to completely redo the Zelda games for the Philips CDI. Which, you know, the CDI has, has become, it's been, become kind of popular for it to be the butt of jokes. However, you know, it's not a complete flop as a console. It had some redeeming moments, but the Zelda games were not one of them. Um, they're terrible, terrible games. If anybody wants to know the story behind them, there's a bunch of pretty cool videos on YouTube about it. Uh, and I really do think the Angry Video Game Nerd video on it was pretty accurate as to how frustrating and weird they were, to be honest. Um, but according to the developer, the features of this one include a widescreen mode, remastered mode for less frustrating play, subtitles, touched up sprites, unlockables, and more. These aren't one-to-one -one remakes with many differences, but I believe they capture the spirit. Um, I played it for just a few moments myself, and it immediately seemed better than the original, and I spoke to Yehel from Wrestling With Gaming, who is probably the biggest CDI fan I've ever met, you know, more so than every other CDI fan I know combined, and uh, he gave it the thumbs up in that, at, at the very least, it was way more playable than the original, and he said he would got farther than he ever had before. So uh, these are for PC and Linux, not for original hardware. But if you wanted to kind of see what these games were all about, but actually play them, not just get frustrated at them for a few moments and walk away, I would think that this is the way to do it. Normally, I'm the person that would recommend, oh, try to see if you could find original hardware, but not not in this case at all. I would kind of go through these. Um, the links keep getting taken down for obvious reasons, so I suggest just checking out the Discord. Um, everything's linked in the post, um, and they should be able to, to keep these alive, at least long enough so anybody that hears this podcast in a reasonable time should be able to download them. But what a very weird and very interesting thing, and I'm glad developers take the time to do stuff like this, even for the, the weird and unpopular games, because it is a fun look at stuff like this. Here's something I've been waiting for for a very, very long time. The Real Phoenix has just released an updated version of Bordy's NES I.O. board for the front-loading NES. And I want to make sure I explain this correctly, because uh, I don't want to confuse anybody. But the purpose of this board is to be able to install a NES RGB kit without cutting the plastic at all and adding some cool features. But it doesn't include the NES RGB. You still have to do that installation. You still have to buy that board from Tim. But once you've installed it onto the main board, rather than cutting a hole in the back of your NES, 
you're able to use this replacement board to route the audio and video. But there's a whole bunch more that makes it really worth the money. So first, it's a replacement for the full RF box, which includes the power circuit. And that's one of the things that always drove me nuts about refurbishing old NES consoles is getting that RF box out and then getting it apart to replace the capacitors is so time consuming. Um, and the capacitors in there are definitely starting to leak out. I've seen many of them already leak. And uh, one sign of this is the RF video quality going severely downhill, which I know many of us don't even care about RF anymore, but that's certainly a sign. Uh, and then once the corrosion gets really bad, the, the NES will just stop working because because it'll burn right through the power circuit. So you could take it all apart and fix it, or you could put one of these in it. Or you could do both, I guess, if you want to preserve the original. But this has the original power circuit. Uh, it has a Genesis 2 DIN where the RF out used to go. Um, and this is set up, uh, you're going to have to wire the NES RGB properly because the Genesis RGB cables have capacitors and resistors in them. So you'll need to know that and follow the Real Phoenix's instructions and how to make sure to get that done right. However, that means not only is it compatible with RGB, it's also compatible with the HD Retrovisions and the RAD 2X, which is pretty awesome. Next to that, where the channel 3 and 4 switch used to be is an S-Video output. And then on the sides, when the original uh, RCA video and audio outputs were, are new ones, and that just gives you the output of the NES RGB, not the internally generated composite video output. So overall, it's a really big upgrade, but even on top of that, it has in-game reset built in. Uh, and, you know, I, that's not something I would use. That's not something I would even wire up, I think. Um, however, it also has the ability to switch color palettes from the controllers, which is a feature I use all the time. I talked about it last week or the week before uh, about how the NES color palettes are generated and why you, you'll you never get exactly what you would have gotten out of composite from an original. So having the ability to say, okay, I'm on Contra, I'm going to use this palette. You know, Now I'm on Legend of Zelda, I'm going to switch to that one. Or heck, even switching on the fly mid-game is really cool. You don't have to get up and flip a switch. You could just kind of sit there and toggle between the palettes. So so many awesome features about this. Um, it's open source. It's a fork of Bordy's original design. So you could make your own or you could buy directly from the real Phoenix. I purchased one. It's en route and I will definitely test it. The only thing about it, which um, I won't know without testing it yet, but the DC to DC regulator on there is a more modern switching style regulator. And it's in fact the same one I believe that Tim Worthington includes on his rear board for the original Famicom, except sometimes I've seen those introduce diagonal jail bars. Now there's no safety issue. It's not gonna hurt your console. It's not like a power safety thing. It just may or may not, depending on your motherboard revision and setup, introduce noise. And if it does, you have two choices. You could replace that with a very expensive $10 one, uh, also a switching regulator and also does not need a heat sink. Or you could just try to find a regular 7801 and a heat sink that'll fit inside of there. Um, and that should be exactly as original. So that's just something to note. I wanted to make sure to make that clear. So if anybody installs this and they start to get jail bars, they don't go, oh, what the heck? You know, the board's totally defective. It's going to be a case per case basis. And it should just be that one part. So uh, I put that in the post um, talking about it now. Hopefully that's enough for, um, you know, enough warning for everybody. If you want more details, I spent spent quite a bit of time writing through this because I was very excited about it. Uh, but I thought it was very cool. I thought it, this is exactly what most people would want if they were installing an sRGB into a front-loading NES. And um, it has all the features. You don't have to cut anything. And overall, the, the only other... I don't even know if you'd consider this a downside, but the only other thing to note is that because the S-Video and the RGB ports are recessed a bit in the plastic, depending on the brand cable you have, you might have to cut a little bit of the rubber shielding of the cable. But I think almost everybody would probably agree that, you know, especially with an S-Video cable, you know, cutting a little bit of the rubber off a $5 S-Video cable is fine compared to cutting plastic on an NES. Um, and I've measured this before because I remember we're talking to the real Phoenix last year about this and most major Genesis two cables should fit without any trimming whatsoever. Um, but 
you know, I haven't tested every single brand out there. So, or maybe there's some older ones that have a different size connector that I don't have to test anymore, but that's the only other thing to keep note of. But overall, I'm very excited for this. I'm looking forward to getting mine and I don't know, I'm not sure if I'll do a video on it, but, uh, at the very least I'll post pictures and just kind of show it off. Cause I thought it was really cool. There's some updates on the Xbox HDMI mod from make megahertz. If you'd purchased the version that works with every version of the Xbox motherboard except 1.6, those are all starting to ship and people have confirmed that they're receiving them. However, if you purchased the version that's designed for the last revision of the Xbox, the version 1.6, those have been delayed. Um, now that's a revision of the Xbox that's kind of always had trouble with mod chips and with soft mods and stuff like that. So it's not too surprising. Um, and you have some choices if you ordered that version. Um, you could either just get your money back. You could replace the 1.6 version with the other board that works on all of them. Or you could just kind of hold off and see what happens. Uh, and if you do that, your shipping label will be canceled and it'll just, you'll get notification when there's some kind of update. So, you know, it's a interesting situation because I, you know, if you look at it one way, if you just bought an Xbox to mod this and it turns out to be a version 1.6, um, it might just be easiest to go to a Goodwill or something and pick up a cheap, you know, older model Xbox and just use that for modding. However, I could completely and totally see a scenario where somebody already had that version of the Xbox, already recapped it, already put a mod chip in it, already put a hard drive and, you know, replaced the CD laser and all that stuff. And that's the one that they wanted to install this kit in. So, you know, if that's the case, I'm, I'm not really sure. You're kind of you're going to kind of have to just judge this and guess for yourself. If it were me personally, I would probably just wait a, wait a little longer and see what happens. Um, once again, you you know, like I talked about last week, you do have PayPal protection for up to 180 days. And there have been plenty of pre-order delays from companies that have gone longer than that, where when people needed refunds or anything like that, they could get them long after the PayPal protection period had ended. Now, of course, there were at least two pretty disastrous ones that I can recall off the top of my head where no one got anything. So I also completely understand a scenario in which you're like, ah, I don't want to take a chance. Let me just get my money back. So... I guess I would just kind of use your own judgment on that one. I'd probably wait at least another month just to see what happens. But at the very least, the other revision board that work, the other revision HDMI board that works with every other rev of Xbox than 1.6 has been shipping. People have been getting it. Um, and, you know, I guess what I talked about was kind of true. It just was a communication issue. And, you know, there was no issues about that. So I'm still not really understanding why all that went down the way it did. Um, you know, I a hundred percent understand people's frustrations that I get, you know, especially the people that are stuck home, even if you're still working, but you're not used to working from home, you're cooped up, you want a project to do, you're not getting any messages back. Like I, I get that frustration. I just, I don't understand the, the craziness that happened. It seemed way more like a, a personal vendetta than, than a genuine concern, because like I talked about last week, there was no, there was no real worry that people were at least at this moment that people were going to get their money taken from them. So I don't know what the heck that was all about. And to be honest, I don't want to know. I, I don't like drama like that. I like drama when my friends make fun of me on a podcast, not craziness like this. So um, I guess, you know, all the suspicions were confirmed, just a communication error. Everything is shipping just a lot slower than expected. But you know, it happens. Uh, and the only real problem is anybody that pre ordered a version 1.6 kit. So just kind of you know, take, uh, take it all into account and make your decision what you would like to do if you ordered one of those. I saved this one for last because there's a story about it afterwards that uh, doesn't really matter to the actual product. So in respect of people's time, I'll give just the facts real quick up front and then go through the story for anybody that cares. And I imagine most won't. That's totally fine. Uh, the open source SCART coupler is now available. Castlemania Games will be selling it. The price is $20 and it's currently a pre-order, but they should ship within a few weeks, uh, you know, barring any crazy issues or anything like that. Um, I think this is something that Ryan's going to try to stock, but just in case, if you were wanting one of these, I would absolutely pick it up just to make sure. Um, it's essentially like a two inch SCART cable um, and it performs really well. 
And I also imagine that a lot of people uh, watching, or I guess who had seen the video, might look at this and go, oh, you know what, this would be a big help for my setup. And respectfully, I also imagine a lot of people would see this and go, that thing's useless for my setup, which is totally cool. Uh, this was really meant to just solve a clutter problem, and it does exactly that if you need it. Uh, so please check out the video on it for all the details that you would need. I'm not going to rehash them all here. But uh, if you do me a favor and, and give the video a watch or even just let it play in the background, because it ended up only being five minutes and I just I don't want to waste anybody's time. You know, it, their videos are supposed to be a minimum of eight minutes and 31 seconds long or they won't get picked up in the algorithm. And I don't want to do that to you. I just it's not. I don't like doing that. It needed to be, it only needed to be five minutes long. So it's only five minutes long. So, Hey, maybe we buck the trend and get this one in the algorithm just to, just to stick it to the man. But that's all the facts about this. There's uh, it's anything I say after this is just a silly story. So if you're listening uh, just straight through, you can close the podcast now. Uh, there's nothing else important after this, but the story behind it does crack me up. And I imagine uh, it would make people laugh that, work on complicated projects, but make silly mistakes sometimes. Cause I think anybody that, that any nerd has gone through this before, but over a year ago, I think it was November of 2019. I was working on a project where there were a ton of cables everywhere. Then the desk that I work on is barely wider than shoulder width. So I was kind of complaining uh, to my friend Tian Feng and said, hey, can you make me a scart coupler? Because I absolutely am tired of this stuff. And I don't even know if these wires running over each other are potentially causing any interference. Nothing noticeable, but maybe when I do my zoom in a thousand time shots, it's going to affect it. So... He whipped up one of these boards for me. I had it made from JLC PCB. And he said, hey, you know, check the pin out on it. And I went, yeah, 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 whatever. I got a, the first run of boards, which were cheap. They were like 10 bucks or something. And I had sent him the wrong pin out. So, you know, I said, all right, whatever. I'll throw these out. Let's make another one. Here's the, definitely the right pin out. Made another run. And he said, you know, all right. Are you sure that you checked these pinouts? I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's a SCART cable. I've been working with these things for like 10 years now. It's fine. Second run shows up and I had forgot that audio was directional in SCART. And when I looked over the pinout, I was just, I forgot to, to mention the cross connection that you need to do. So, you know, I cut the traces. I, you know, I t t toned everything out to make sure. And I said, all right, one last run. <laughs> and uh, we did one, you know, one more practice run and everything was absolutely perfect. So I screwed up twice of the easiest thing that I've worked on in the past two years and I somehow screwed it up. <laughs> uh, but I got a bunch of scar heads from China and uh, taped it together. Um, well, I soldered it together and then just taped it for insulation. And I started testing. And what we found is that it, it performs exactly like what a two-inch shielded SCART cable would perform like, which is great because I was really afraid that a design like this might take away from some of these comparisons that I do. Now, I was never afraid of it being bad performing in a real-life scenario, but I thought, hey, is this going to add 1% of audio buzz so when I do comparisons, it, you know, it'll skew it? Or when I zoom in on Link's face a thousand times you know, to make it, you know, to make his entire face 4K, is it going to add anything? And what we found is the opposite. Because all analog video signals, the, the longer the cable, the more interference that's added, it's actually really, really well performing. Once again, in real world performance, you probably are not going to notice a difference at all between this and a six foot shielded SCAR cable, but it's just really nice to know that I could use this for my testing and not ever have to worry about it taking away from the testing. So I was pretty pumped about that. Uh, we then sent the prototypes over to Greg from Laser Bear, who came up with a really neat and ingenious design in that both sides of the case are actually the same part. So you never have to worry about printing out accidentally two lefts or two rights. It's the same for both sides. And Greg also made a jig that you just drop in the board and the SCART connectors, uh, and it makes it way easier to start soldering it together and to make sure that the board lines up properly. So I was very excited about that. Um, I ended up making this video right after Greg came up with the case. So we're talking May so, you know, early summer, May, late, late spring, something like that. 
Uh, and then we talked to Insurrection Industries because I really thought that this was a product people would want. I didn't, you know, at first I was like, hey, T, can you help me make something for us? And then I, as we started to see the performance and how cool it was, and I showed pictures of this in the video, uh, you know, we kind of thought, hey, I, I think this is something that we want to get in the hands of people. But Insurrection kind of took a look at it. And at first, the world shut down. So that was a giant delay right there. And when everything opened back up, they kind of realized that in a production environment, you need a thicker board. So places like OSH Park, JLC PCB, um, if you order these you at the max thickness board, there's still a bit of a gap. So when you're soldering them, you just have to be careful. But if you're soldering one or two of these for yourself, it's totally easy to make sure everything lines up. But if you're doing a run of 100 you know, in a manufacturing facility, you want these extra precautions. So after the world opened back up, Insurrection took the time to make sure that they were the files were made in a way where you could make them in production and not worry about this stuff, not worry about angled pins and bent stuff. So the open source files are in the post, but they're the files that you can get made at JLC, PCB, OSH Park, and all the rest. They're not some impossible to make file. We wanted to make sure that the ones that, you know, that were thoroughly tested through those manufacturing uh, facilities are what people could get if they wanted to make their own. And I guess if anybody needs the other ones, you know, I'm sure we could make those available. Also, um, Greg made the 3D print available for anybody want, that wants to make their own, both the case and the jig. Or you could buy them directly from him if you just want some pre-made ones. And to be honest, I think this is a very cool project, but not a cost-effective project. Unless you live in a place where shipping from Castlemania is really high, which, you know, if you live on the other side of the world, of course. But, you know, especially if you live in the U.S. or Canada, if you were to order three boards and then six cart heads and then either, you know, and have to order the 3D printed case, it's a fun project. And in fact, it's one that I would absolutely recommend for beginners. But this isn't something that you could make yourself to save some cash. Buying it, you know, having a run of production made would actually be cheaper. But honestly, if, if you've been wanting to mess around with soldering and you're afraid to touch consoles because, hey, I've, I've never done this before, expect that, you know, if you make three, only one's going to end up right. But this actually is a pretty cool project to start. Um, and because the pins are big, even if you get a couple of crooked ones, you could heat them up and move them. I mean, it's kind of a fun project. So definitely something I would recommend for people just starting out. Um I guess that pretty much sums up the whole thing. I just, I've been talking about this for a while. I've been excited about it for a while. I've used this, not only have I shown it in a bunch of videos, but I've used this in a ton of testing and I was just very happy with how much clutter it saved. And especially when you're just connecting a bunch of stuff together, how much easier it was, provided you run the cables properly. As I showed in the video, you know, you don't want to put pressure on them or anything, so... I'll end my long ranty story. I just thought that um, people who make products or, or had projects like this would really get a kick out of the whole, you know, I didn't make a mistake in the most complicated thing I've done, but I screwed up twice in just about the easiest thing I've been a part of in the past couple of years. So hopefully that kind of put a smile on other developers' faces just to know that you're not alone when, you, when we make these mistakes. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks to everybody that watches and listens, and of course, thank you to everybody that supports on any of the support services like Patreon and Floatplane, because without your support, these videos, the behind the scenes research, and stuff like the SCART coupler, and a million other projects I can't talk about yet, would, would never come to light without your help. You're, I know this sounds cheesy and it sounds like an infomercial, but you really are the reason this stuff happens. So thank you so much, and I'll see you next week. <laughs>